The second type of distribution we'd like to discuss in this lecture is the case of an, an infinite plane with a uniform service charge. We agreed this service charge, if you, can, you can try to imagine it like dust on a, on a plane, and the dust is varying from one point to another, means that the charge density is varying from one point to another. And here we talk about service charge density, so we talk about column per meter squared. And as we did for the uh, linear case, we have here an infinite plane extending. We'll assume that this infinite plane is divided into small um, infinitesimal circular, uh, service elements. And each service element will be considered like a buoyant charge. And we apply column law, uh, or the expression for the electric field based on column law, uh, to that buoyant charge to calculate the field at the observation point. So we'll hear what we will do. We'll assume that the observation points at 0, 0, and h to so assume the, the x and y coordinates of the observation point to be 0. We'll assume it has a height h from that plane. So h does not change. h is a, very, is, is a constant. Um, and here, because this problem seems to have a, a, a cylindrical uh, symmetry, because you can look at this plane like a circle of infinite radius. So what we'll do, we'll use uh, the typical um, area element in, in cylindrical coordinates. If you remember, this is here is d rho, and this one here is rho d phi. And we integrate rho from, uh, from uh, 0 here to infinity to, get, to, come, to sum the contribution from all components, and to integrate phi from 0 along the x-axis up to 2 pi to, to, uh, to sum all the contribution from, from all elements. So, um, so this is a, this is the this is the charge of that infinitesimal service element. It is the charge density which is column per meter squared multiplied by the area. And here again, I'm warning you: rho here is not a length. Rho s is not a length. Rho s is simply that service charge density in column per meter squared. The area, as we know from Slavian coordinates, is rho d rho d phi as obtained from that element here. So we can say that the field resulting from one of these elements at the observation point will be along the line connecting these two these two elements here, these two points here. Well, the line pointing from the that, that differential element to my observation point. Okay, so we can see that DE, the contribution, is 1 over 4 by epsilon DQ R squared AR. R is the distance between the uh, that infinitesimal service element to my observation point. What is the, what is the length R used here? R is this length, and if my charge is my field, my what you call source point or source element, has a radius of rho from the origin, and this one has a height of h, then this distance here is nothing but square root rho square plus h square. Now, what about this unit vector? In cylindrical coordinates, this unit vector has two components. I can simply decompose it into uh, this vector here in the in the minus rho direction and this vector here in the minus z direction. So this one, this vector in the rho direction is minus rho a rho and this vector here along the z direction is equal to h a z and remember h is a constant. This is the height of my observation point which you assume to be constant. So what we what we'll do here is that we'll simply start to sum all the contribution resulting from every from all elements. One point to notice here that if I have an element which is this one here, there is a, an opposing element at the same distance from the origin on the on the x y plane, and uh, this one will also create a field at this point. And if you have a uniform charge density, the charge density is the same every point on this surface. You can see that actually the resulting field from this one and the resulting field from this one are equal. Okay, and if you decompose them into two parts, you have actually two components one in the rho direction, this one and this one, and one in the z direction. You will see that the two z components do add to each other, while the rho components do subtract. So, because of the nature of this problem, we can simply say just by taking a look at it, that there will not have any rho component. Rho components cancel out because for every element, uh, on the every differential element on the surface, there is another element that creates a rho component that cancels the original rho component, while z components always add to one another. So now we're all set. We have to start from this expression using, using this dq, this dq here. Replace r by, its, by this value. 
replace AR by this value, replace AR by unit vector in this direction, so it is this R divided by its length, and do the integration, we have to integrate rho from 0 to infinity, so integrate rho from 0 up to infinity to cover the whole plane, uh, phi from 0 up to 2 pi. So um, if you put all this together, this is this is the expression for the uh, for the electric field, and the, here I use the expression where I put the total total vector divided by the length vector of the vector cubed. So this R cubed here, and as I said in the lecture, they are both equivalent to one another. Uh, because of symmetry, as we agreed, we'll ignore the row components. What I will do, I will simply ignore this part. I will only keep the H A Z, and then I will integrate it. We'll integrate it through from zero to infinity. Uh, phi from 0 up to 2 pi uh, and um, what we will do uh, here is that we will we'll start to simplify this integral with rho s is a constant I am assuming here that it's a uniform uh, surface charge density so the charge is uniform all over that infinite plane but in many problems if rho s is not a constant it changes with rho you cannot take it out from the integral you have to put the expression here but in this case I, I was able to take it out with the other constants and then we carry out this integral here um, we integrate first over phi because integral over phi is easy there is no phi dependence here this will give you 2 pi, 2 pi will cancel with 4 pi and we end up with 2 in the denominator and then the integral of this term it's obvious that we have here rho and rho is a differentiation of the rho squared inside the, 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 that term so we will integrate this one and um, this is to the power minus 3 over 2, so you add 1 and you divide by minus 1 half, and this will cancel with the 2 that you will add. So then you end up with this expression, you get this bracket here, raised to power minus 1 half with a negative sign. This is very typical integral, you should be able to do it from your work in the first year. Um, you, you substitute for rho equal to infinity, this will give you 0 because it's negative power. You substitute for rho equal to 0. This will give you h squared to power to minus one half. So this will give here minus one over h, okay, with a negative sign because the lower limit. So you get one over h. So it cancels out of this one, and this is the result that you have. Now this result is really remarkable because it tells you that the electric field does not depend on the distance from the plane. So uh, if you have a plane which is charged, it's an infinite plane then the field here is the same as the field here same as the field here they are all pointing normal to the to the to the to that plane and you all have the same strengths even if you are a very far distance from that plane in reality usually we don't have something called an infinite plane we have planes of finite charge like the ones we use in capacitances and in uh, building capacitors and in that case uh, the electric field does decay when you move away from the uh, from the from that plane but for the infinite plane which is a little bit hypothetical case uh, you end up with this nice expression which is depends only on the surface charge density and on the material used now one word of warning i if I, if if i'm trying to observe the field at a point below below the uh, field below the below the plane then uh, what's happening is that the electric field we will be pointing this direction because this is what this is how the positive charges residing on this plane are trying to push any positive charge that you will put here trying to push them away so the field is actually symmetric and the top part it's pointing in the uh, in the z direction here so this is az and in for all points below the plane the field is point, pointing in the ne in negative z direction okay because we are z really was taken as a direction normal to the plane so the, the whether it is the, the the positive normal or the negative normal does not really make a difference the field is always pointing out from the plane trying to push any positive charges away from that plane so in general for any orientation of such a charged plane any infinite plane and here i picked another plane oriented along the x-axis the norm is along the x-axis so you can see here what we have in the, for the positive x side, the electric field is, is pointing in the positive x direction. For the negative x side, the electric field is, neg is the negative x direction. So it's either a n, which is the normal to the field, if you are on the positive side from the plane, or minus a n. And this should apply for any orientation of any of the plane. So I can give you any arbitrary plane. You have to determine wh what is your normal a n. You have to determine whether the point is on the top side or the bottom side of the plane and then determine what will be your direction of the field.
Another interesting problem that we use as well in this uh, in this uh, example is when you put um, two infinite planes. So I have here one infinite plane with a positive charge, another infinite plane with a negative charge, and they have the same surface charge density. So this one here has rho s column per meter squared positive charge. This one here has minus rho s column per meter squared negative charge. Um, for the for the positive plane, as we agreed in previous slide, if this is your plane, the field is always pointing in the outward direction. If you have a positive charge density, if you have a negative plane, the field is always pointing towards the plane. So if on the positive side is this way, in the negative side it will be this way. If you combine these two together, as you can see here, if you combine this one and this one, you will see that the 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 do add up. In the region in between so if you the region in between them yeah you can get a positive field and outside this one this this plane here will create a field and this will create a field pointing downward this one creates a field pointing upward and they cancel so this is simply saying uh, this 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 uh, structure which we call a variable capacitor will have only a field ideally a field in the region between the two capacitors between the two plates that we have and the field there is double that of a single plate because they do add to each other you can see this one is pointing downward and this one is pointing downward as well in between in between they do add but outside the field here is pointing upward from the negative side while the field here is pointing downward from the positive side this extends downward so um so this is telling us ideally we should have no um no field outside in reality, fields, uh, the, the, the capacitors that we use, they, ha they have a finite area, and there is something called fringing field. So there can be some field outside. It can be weak, but still there is some field outside. So here is a field obtained by uh, uh, an electrostatic um, solver, not, not any different from the one you use for open EM. So we have here um, a positive uh, plate. This is a positive charge plate. It has a finite dimension, not infinite. A negative charge blade you can see the field in between because of the color scheme we're using the field in between is very strong and it's pointing from the positive charges here to the negative charges here outside some field there is some fringing field from positive to negative some from positive to negative okay but the field outside is way weaker than the field inside look at the color scheme this one is high while this one is pretty low so the, the, the field inside is really concentrated and it approximates that of the ideal case, but you should always remember there is some fringing field pointing from the positive plate to the negative plate. So this is a typical uh, two blade capacitor, uh, as you could see here, and this is how the field looks like. So let's take a look at one example. We have here an infinite sheet of unit of charge. Um, it's a surface charge, 10 nanocolumn per meter squared. It exists at the plane y equal to minus 2 would like to evaluate the electric field at the point 0, 2, and 1 meters. And I explained to you earlier, the direction of the field in this case, of the case of an infinite sheet, will depend on what side of the plane you are in. So we have to draw a diagram and see where is our observation point, where is our field point. We call this point the observation of the field point relative to the plane. But we know that the field, because an infinite plane does not depend on the distance, its constant is equal to rho s divided by 2, two epsilon naught in the normal direction. So I drew here this symbol diagram where you can see that we have here the y axis and this is the x axis. Um, and uh, this is here is, uh, is, uh, is, the, is the infinite plane that we have. This is the infinite plane that we have. So th there are infinite positive charges here. I'm just showing a short a cut. So this is a y, uh, y x plane. And in that case, the plane will look like a line. It will look like a line. The field on this side is pointing this way, and the field on the opposite side, in any point on the opposite side, is will be pointing in this shown way here. Okay. Now, because my observation point is this is along this direction, it has a y of equal to two meters. So it is a positive side. It's along the positive side of the plane. Then, in that case. The normal here, if you try to see what is the normal here in this direction, it is AY. So your field will be in the AY direction, and its value is equal to rho S divided by 2 epsilon naught. You simply substitute rho S is equal to 10 nanocolumn, as you could see here. 
and uh, you bought two epsilon epsilon naught one over thirty six by two to the minus nine. This one will cancel with this one to give you eighteen multiply by ten. Ten to the minus nine will cancel to ten to the minus nine. You end up with one hundred and eighty by in the y direction. And if you simplify that, you get five sixty five point four eight volt per meter in the y direction. The units of uh, electric field is volt per meter. Now the, again, as we explained, the v, the field is independent of distance. So even if y was infinity, it doesn't matter. The field have been the same. But uh, because this is really a, a, a two ideal case, there is nothing called an infinite plane. Um, the field the field is, is really um, in reality it always depends on distance as the case with distance. We have here a second example. We have um, two actually planes of charged planes. The first one is at z equal to minus three. It has a surface charge rho s one one hundred nanocoulomb per meter squared. We have another uh, charge sheet with rho s two equal to one minus hundred uh, minus one hundred nanocoulomb per meter squared. So these two are opposite. So this is the case we talked about, the case of a capacitor. Uh, so between the two blades, the field is doubled, but outside outside this area, uh, surrounded by these two blades, the field will be zero because each one of them will cancel the other. So he would like to calculate the field at a number of points zero and zero, the origin zero zero six. So again, if I, if I don't state, it's simply all in meters six six and six, and the last one is zero zero and minus six. So as I explained earlier, you start by drawing a diagram and take a look at the different locations. So I draw first the first plane. The first plane is at z y equal to minus three. So it is this plane here. And uh, the field, of course, in this case, would be pointing a lot, um, outward from the plane. So for all y greater than minus 3, it's in the positive z direction. I'm sorry, it's, uh, it's actually not, uh, not y equal to minus 3, z equal to minus 3. So uh, the normal to the plane is really uh, the, here, the z, di z direction. And for all points below that plane, the field will be pointing in the minus z direction as shown here. Now, for the other plane charge with negative charge, so this one has negative charge, the field is actually pointing inward. So for all points with z greater than 3, the field is in the negative z direction. For all points for z less than 3, the field is pointing in the positive z direction. When you sum these two contributions, this one, this one, and this one here, you can see they add each other between minus 3 and 3, and they cancel each other outside. So the field exists only in the region between minus 3 and 3 and will cancel for any point less than, with z less than minus 3 and for any point with z, then greater than, with z greater than 3. So the expression for the field where in the region uh, surrounded or it has the two planes surrounding it between minus 3 and 3 is double that of a single plane. It's rho s over epsilon naught and for any other points outside this region it is 0. At the point 0, 0, and 0, the point, the origin has a coordinate z of equal to 0, so it's between minus 3 and 3, so it's had this value. We put here 100 nanocoulomb per meter squared, as you could see. We put here epsilon naught 1 over 36 by 10 to the minus 9, and the field, as we agreed, will be in the z direction. This will give us 3600 by az, and uh, in this one here, if you simplify it, you will replace by by uh, 3.14, you end up by 11.309 kilovolt per meter. For all the other given points, you could see here z is greater, uh, greater than 3. Here z is equal to 6 and 6. So it's outside the region surrounded by these two planes. So the field must be 0 automatically. And this one here had z less than minus 3. So uh, the field again will be 0. So the, the two planes cancel each other out in this region. But one thing I want to mention here is how to program something like this, how to program it in MATLAB. So if I give you any arbitrary service with service charge that can vary even from one point to another, and I tell you, please calculate for me the field here at this point R. The way of doing it is very simple. Divide your, your service area into small elements, so tiny service elements, maybe, maybe triangles, maybe squares, but they have to be very small, okay? Very tiny service elements. And then what you will do, you go over each element one by one, determine the distance or the vector pointing from here to here. We call this vector here, I'll call this one R I dash, so it's, it is the distance between the ith service element to my observation point. 
So the, we determine the vector r, which is really uh, pointing from uh, from my source point to my observation point. So it's going to be r minus r i dash. And if you don't mind, I will call it r i. And then we can determine what is the charge on this uh, small service element here. So I can determine what is the charge here. I simply multiply the service charge density here by the area of that element. We can do that. And then we, what we will do next, we will simply do summation over qi over 4 by epsilon modulus ri. And uh, you multiply this by r minus ri dash. You do this summation over all i. If you have an n element, those this, this will go from 1 to n. So in general, for any arbitrary service, you apply superposition. You divide your service into a number of service elements, calculate the vector pointing from your service element to your observation point, which is ri here in this case. So you'll have to do this again for this one. You have to do this again for this one. And then you determine the charge of every element. It's the surface charge multiplied by the area of that element. And then you apply Coulomb's law, which is the expression for the field here, assuming that every element is tiny enough to be represented by a surface charge, by like, like a point charge. Of course, the, the finer your, your discretization is, the better answer that you will get. But of course, the more time and more computation that you will need. So this is how you would program it in a, in a, in a MATLAB or a C program.